afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? All right. Welcome to the African American Workshop and Lecture Series, which was established to cultivate a better understanding of and appreciation for the vast contributions that Black people have made to our country and our world. We thank you most sincerely for investing your time with us today. Now, at this juncture, we invite you to breathe, sit back, and relax. You are in for a special time of engagement, dialogue, and inspiration. Please feel free to use the question and answer function to share questions and comments. And now it is my pleasure to welcome our president, Michael Scheel, who will give an introduction for today's speaker. Mike? Thank you, Yvette. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Michael Schill, president of the University of Oregon. It is my absolute pleasure today to welcome you to today's African-American workshop and lecture series event. And, and today is a real treat for me. Uh, our discussion today is gonna feature a giant in higher education, President Ruth Simmons, who's going to offer her insights on civil society's debt to higher education. And as I said to President Simmons right before, in, in these days of COVID, it takes a lot to get me to put on a tie and a jacket. And this is one of the few events that I would do that for. Um, I wanna start by thanking uh, Yvette Alex Asenso and the staff of the Division of Equity and Inclusion for their continuing work in facilitating this great series. Now more than ever, it is incredibly important for us to critically engage with conversations about race and inequality. The university is committed to providing opportunities like this series for our community to come together and to grapple with many of the difficult issues of our time. Now, as an extraordinarily accomplished educator and administrator, President Simmons is a leader in these efforts. She continues to inspire and to support the community she serves, as well as many of us who have followed her career. We continue to learn from her constantly every year. President Simmons holds a BA in French from Diller University and both a master's degree and a doctorate in Romance Languages from Harvard University. She began her career as an assistant professor in French at the University of New Orleans. She held professorships and served in a variety of administrative roles at the University of Southern California, Spelman College, Princeton University, before becoming the president of Smith College. She made history as the first African-American woman to head a major college or university, and also by starting the first engineering program in an American women's college. President Simmons again made history as the first African-American president of an Ivy League university when she became the president of Brown in 2001. She established the Brown University Steering Committee on Slavery and Justice in 2003 to investigate the university's historical connection to the transatlantic slave trade. The committee published a response to the inquiry in 2007 and also extensive recommendations for how the university should move forward with this historical context in mind. Now, throughout her career, President Simmons has been a prominent advocate of equal opportunity education for students of color and for women. She has brought her wealth of knowledge and her tremendous administrative experience to Prairie View a and University, where she has served as president since 2017. She is the recipient of the 2002 Fulbright Lifetime Achievement Medal, the Medal of Distinguished Service from Columbia University Teachers College, in addition to many, many accolades. And she's a member 
of the National Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Philosophical Society, and has served as chair of the Council of Ivy Group Presidents. So it is really a pleasure indeed and an honor for me to have President Simmons with us today. And I'm looking forward to the discussion. So please join me in welcoming President Ruth Simmons. Thank you very much for that introduction. I didn't recognize um, who we were talking about, but thank you. Thank you anyway, uh, President Jill. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm really delighted to be invited to this event. Today's program has been a long time in the making, and finally, uh, I'm, I'm here. I've had the occasion to visit the campus in the past, and I must say that the virtual visit does not measure up to being actually on the campus. Nonetheless, it's a pleasure to spend some time with you all today. I'm gonna to offer just a few thoughts um, about higher education's debt to society. Uh, and then what I really want to do is engage in, in um, conversation with all of you. A good deal has happened in my life since my last visit to the University of Oregon. I completed my term as president of Brown, an extraordinarily rewarding experience, I have to say. During my time there, I had the challenge of tackling the issue of the founders' involvement in the slave trade. At the time I commissioned a study of this subject, I did so out of a very simple impulse to know the truth of the university's origins which had long been buried in an effort to burnish the university's image. Affected by the deep and punishing segregation of my own youth, I had longed for my earliest days as a student for institutions and public figures to tell the truth. Indeed, I became enamored with a career in higher education because I believed it to be a place that harbored and protected scholars who fought for the truth. As president, I thought it was my duty to uphold the value of truth telling in all that we did at the university. Offer an example to students, setting a standard for the university's work and serving the public good in the very best way we could. I didn't realize that so few people would welcome or be prepared for the truth. I come to you now from a very different kind of university, an HBCU. I came into this role unexpectedly after my retirement from Brown. My relationship with Prairie View had been as a family member of a Prairie View alumnus. No more than that, really. But I was aware of the outsized role that the university played in the transition from segregation to integration, from trenchant systemic discrimination to the opening up of opportunity to African-Americans, from the realm of the impossible to the realm of the possible. It is not difficult at all to imagine how bleak the landscape of African-American participation in the Texas economy would be today without Prairie View a &M University. Its critical production of educators, engineers, nurses, and business people changed the character and outlook of the African-American community in definitive ways. But that work is not done, not by long shot. Every year, students of every race and religion arrive on the Hill, anxious for the same opportunity afforded previous generations of students at Prairie View. They come bearing immense, immense ambition and stunning dreams of success. They often come carrying the weight of lifting their families out of poverty. Many come seeking an environment in which they can simply flourish with a freedom of being that they have never, ever known. They come caring about and seeking empowerment to tackle entrenched social problems. They come seeking the roadmap to a life of meaning and happiness. 
For those entering college today, it cannot be easy to dream of such a life. They are surrounded by troubling issues that cast doubt on what their future might hold. Whether considering the state of environmental degradation, the potential for international conflict, the state of race relations, gender equality, and religious intolerance, or the impact of economic challenges on what they can accomplish, they understand that their journey will not always be easy or predictable. They hear and read in social media a torrent of threats and vectors and other terms I care not allude to. They see stunning failures of leadership. And in spite of undeniable progress, they also expect that discrimination will for the foreseeable future be a factor in the degree of success they enjoy, no matter what their preparation. Discrimination will be a factor in their success. But still, they dream. And we on our campus have the tremendous honor to work to protect and enhance their ability to do just that. The obligation is a sacred one, and it is especially important to me because so many in my life overlooked the compelling evidence that my future was not bright. I was a woman, I was poor, I was black, with few opportunities and a product, and I was a product of Jim Crow segregation. But here's the thing, educators prepared me for a world very different from the world that I lived in very different from what I could see at the time. They enabled my dreams by insisting that I keep working and preparing for a different life with the freedom and ability to excel. It turns out that none of us is wise enough or clever enough to see into the future. Today's problems and realities are often top of mind for us. I wonder if we should move dreaming to the top of mind position for what have we to lose by setting our sights ever higher, asking ourselves to work as if we have the power to change the world? Dreamers have long found a place in universities. The search for new knowledge, the exploration of societal improvement, the rigorous hunt for discoveries that will improve health and prolong life, all these efforts arise from dreamers who can imagine a reality different from what they see before them. This is how universities serve society best, by holding up to the world possibilities unimagined. Long before universities as we know them were created, scholars traversed bad boundaries and cultures, seeking out learned and created and creative individuals from whom they could learn and be inspired. In today's world, we have adopted an impoverished version of this search for learned minds. The modern university more often narrows the aperture, tending to seek out and admit those who are more similar than different. This is not simply unfortunate. It is contrary to all that the university should represent. And what is that? Openness to the breadth of knowledge and to the many ways of knowing. Universities have become enamored with elitism, eliminating the unworthy rather than embracing difference in the service of expanding their capacity to innovate and serve society. To call out this narrowness of vision is the truth telling imperative of our time, I believe. I spent many years focused on trying to do just that. I've served as president and provost of women's colleges, as president of an Ivy League university, as president now of an historically black university. The artificial lines that separate universities reflect the systemic bias that troubles so many. I travel among such institutions in an effort to demonstrate how pernicious and artificial these lines actually are. We wrestle with diversity as if this is a new and puzzling concept. 
the very origins of scholarship teaches that it is not. Universities, more than any sector of society, must reflect the humanity that they hope to serve. We owe society the opportunity to understand who we are as human beings. We can only do that by admitting to the fellowship of learning the many distinctive groups and individuals that make up our world and who can contribute to revealing our rich humanity and the many ways that we all contribute to knowledge and discovery. So I'm gonna stop there and again say, I'm pleased to spend some time with you today. And I very much look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Simmons. Wonderful uh, meal and full of filled with good ideas and thoughts that we will follow with questions and uh, comments. So as a first step, let's begin with a trip down memory lane. Oh dear. <laughs> Courtesy of a quote from Fannie Lou Hamer, uh, who we all know is an African-American voting rights activist. Now, Fannie Lou Hamer said, never forget where we come from and always praised the bridges that carried us over. You talked about the importance of dreaming. Certainly there were folks in your life who helped you think about yourself as a dreamer. Thinking about where you are today, what are the unforgettable aspects of your past and the bridges that carried you over into the places that you find yourself today? Well, first of all, um, I'm the youngest of 12, um, the last child born to a sharecropper family. And um, our prospects in life were um, admittedly very limited. Um, I happened to encounter teachers who put in my head that I had ability that I could not myself discover, um, but um, with a certain insistence, they came to the view that I had promise and that I could actually go to college. Well, college had never been a word mentioned in our household. And so um, naturally it was quite foreign to me, this idea of going to college. Um, my mother had worked as a maid, my, my sisters had worked as maids, and I thought, Surely that was what awaited, awaited me. Um, but the idea of continuing to learn uh, was intriguing. And so um, I have to say that my, my teacher at Phyllis Wheatley High School in Houston, who insisted that I go to college, um, had an extraordinary influence on me in changing the direction of my life. Um, she recently died from COVID and I had the burden of seeing her body to the gravesite. It was one of the most important things, most meaningful things to me I think I've done um, because of what her efforts uh, meant to me. Um, second thing I will say is that, you know, my mother was an extraordinary woman. She was, uh, she had an eighth grade education but she was also a teacher and she taught all of her children some very essential um, things about life. And the most essential thing was um, really how to treat people, how to respect others, how not to put yourself ahead of other people. And as a, a very simple woman with very little experience, um, how she had the wisdom to uh, emphasize that to us is extraordinary. But to, to me, I think part of my success, if I might call it that, has to do with my enduring belief that I should treat people um, fairly, that I should respect everybody, uh, and that I should not presume myself to be better than others simply because I have a PhD or because I uh, am president of a, of a university. Um, next, I had the opportunity when I was 17 years old 
to go to Mexico and to live with a Mexican family. Um, I was studying Spanish. And in the segregated world that I grew up in, this experience outside of my own culture for the first time had a decisive impact on me. And as a consequence of that, um, I set off on a journey to learn as much as I could about the vastness of humanity um, and uh, about different cultural uh, traditions. And um, in, in a way to discern why we are all so magnificently different and what each of us has to offer uh, because of that. And so that shaped my path um, as well, because I have been since that moment, uh, and even today on the same journey to make sure that I can speak to uh, the importance of um, coming to know other people who are different from us, coming to enhance our learning because we're willing to listen to difference of opinion. Um, all of those things shaped my intellectual uh, trajectory. Uh, they've shaped my career path. Um, they've shaped fundamentally uh, who I am today. We know that you attended uh, as an undergraduate, a historically black college. Tell us about your experiences there. And, um, and then I'd like to follow up with another question about sort of the myths that folks have about HBCUs and PWIs? Well, first of all, I went to uh, Dillard University in New Orleans because this teacher who inspired me had gone to Dillard and she was trying to find a way for me to get to college. And so the easiest path for her was to talk them into giving me a scholarship, which she did. And so I went, I went to Dillard, but I made a lot of trouble there. Uh, frankly, uh, I, I didn't fit in. Uh, I, was, I was a bit of a nerd and I was quite outspoken um, as a young person. I, I just knew everything. You know, you have 17, 18 year olds, are, they know everything. Well, I was like that. And worse than that, I, I would tell people, I, I didn't hold it, hold it in. So, so um, when my students at Smith and Brown would ask me, Ruth, why is it that in spite of all of the things that you went through in segregation, that you were able to rise to leadership and be confident of your leadership. How is that possible? They wanted to know. And I always said, well, because I went to an HBCU. And what did they do for me? They, they gave me the ability to find my voice because I could, I could, within that context, I could be a troublemaker and I was not, I was not, I was not sent to special class because I was a troublemaker. Um, that doesn't mean I wasn't a nuisance. I was very much a nuisance to the president and, and to the faculty probably, but, um, but they embraced the idea that they were shaping my future. And they gave me room to become the person that I wanted to be. And I could make those mistakes and I could feel that support. And I was not embarrassed by it. I didn't feel that if I spoke up in class that people would castigate me for, for what I said. Um, uh, I didn't, uh, I, I never felt there were eyes on me all the time. Uh, uh, I could be, uh, anything really that I wanted to do. So many of our students on our campuses, on, on um, uh, campuses where um, they are not um, in significant numbers, feel, have that feeling that uh, the eyes are on them all the time, um, judging them, stereotyping them. Um, and that's a hard, hard feeling to live with, certainly as a young person. Um, and who wants to be in an environment in which um, you don't have the full comfort of being who you are? One of the things that I learned um, educationally is that, oh my goodness, and my first, my first year, I took a course on existentialism at, at Dillard. And when I think about all of the things that I was doing as a student, there were no impediments to what I could do. 
Uh, I could study anything I wanted to study. I could do anything that I wanted to. Let me give you a concrete example. So, so I decided to major in French. Um, and my junior year, I went to Wellesley on an ex student exchange. And I, honestly, I was lost. Uh, and I didn't, I was lost because I had never uh, been in a French speaking environment. Um, but all of the other students, mostly wealthy students, had all been to France. And so they were speaking fluent French. And I was adult. I didn't, I didn't even understand what was going on in the class. So I went to my professor and I said, I'm very sorry, I have to drop the course because I'm, I'm completely lost in this course. And he said, well, no, don't do that. Just work harder, which I thought was so deeply insensitive, really. I just thought he was the worst person in the world. Um, uh, but I did. I worked harder and I went to the laboratory and I practiced my French and so on. And, and as you know, I, I got a Fulbright, I got a PhD in French and so forth. Um, but if that same experience had happened at Dillard, um, I would never have even suggested that I should drop out of a course. Uh, I would have persevered. I wouldn't have been embarrassed. I was embarrassed at Wellesley because I was the only black student in the class. And I didn't, and I was lost and I looked stupid and I didn't know how to say, um, you know, I just don't know what to do. Um, so that comfort is a big, is a big part of it, uh, to be perfectly honest. And I'm surprised when I think about this professor uh, in most circumstances, the professor would have allowed me to drop the course, honestly. I don't know why he didn't, um, uh, because I can tell you in, in, in a black college, the professor would have said, suck it up and get back to work. <laughs> and, so, and so the other benefit that you get in a, a black college is people tell you the truth about what you're doing. And it's so hard to get that feedback. Uh, when the interference of race enters, because people want to be polite, they want to be patronizing, uh, they don't want to tell you what they really think. And so you get pushed along often in those environments with people not being truthful about what you need to do. Um, and so I'm grateful, I'm grateful to him that he didn't say, okay, Ruth, uh, of course it's hard for you, dear, just go ahead and drop the course. He said, just get to work and go and, and, and study because if you study, you'll get it. Um, so um, the other thing about HBCUs is that I think everybody should be comfortable with who they are. Um, shame is a terrible thing, you know. Uh, it poisons um, human beings. If you're ashamed, and I know something of this because for much of my life, I was desperately ashamed of being poor. I thought that, you know, it was shameful to be poor. Imagine that. You know, poverty is about not having enough money. It has nothing to do with your character. It has nothing to do with your value as a human being. But we often make poor people feel so much less than they are simply by virtue of the condition of their purse. It's a horrible thing. So I advocate, students come to me and say, well, Ruth, I'm thinking about going to this place or that place. And I always say, go where you feel comfortable mm -hmm. because every person deserves to be in a learning environment where they can feel comfortable because they will work harder, they will achieve more, um, they will do better. Um, if they feel that degree of comfort. And so you, you, when you talk about this notion of comfort, it's, it's an issue that we ourselves are dealing with on campus, uh, not only for black students, but for, for all students of color and those who find themselves underrepresented. What, what is the message? What are the tools and resources that faculty especially, uh, who, don't, who are not underrepresented, should think about or use in making students feel comfortable enough to learn. And, and what you're saying really lines up with the neuroscience research, right? About folks being so focused on fear and stereotype threat that they can't even concentrate to learn. Right. Yeah. So, so what would you suggest? Uh, and what work did Brown and Smith and in other places uh, in these contexts? 
Uh, well, first of all, uh, you know, when I was president of Brown, uh, when I went into the student center, I'd go and stand in one spot and then I'd wait because I knew the students were all gonna come up to me and give me a hug. So I, the metaphor that I use for our work in the academy is that everybody needs that embrace. Mm-hmm. And what does that embrace say? Mm-hmm. It says that you matter. It says that you belong here. It says that we believe in your ability um, to do the work. It says that I am here to help you advance and I'm committed to doing that. And while I embrace you, I'm also going to challenge you. So a lot of us forget that embrace. Maybe we don't have time for it. Um, Maybe we feel awkward about it. But um, if a student doesn't feel that embrace uh, from those of us who are present to help them do that, uh, then um, of course they're not gonna feel comfortable. Uh, Of course not. Um, I once had a student, a Native American student who uh, gave up um, and decided that that was it. So he he went home for Thanksgiving and um, decided not to come back. And when I found out that he didn't come back, um, I I called him. Uh, He was back on the reservation um, and I spoke to his sister first and and then uh, to him and I said, what are you doing? He said, well, if I decided that I was not going to come back. And I said, oh yes, you're coming back. (laughs) You're gonna find the first plane that you can get on and you're gonna get back here. You've You've missed some classes, but you get back here within a day and I'll worry about the classes that you've missed, but you get back here. <laughs> uh, and of course he showed up uh, and he finished, uh, he, he's a, today a brilliant writer, um, uh, but sometimes it just takes that one embrace to mm-hmm. say, yeah, you may think it doesn't matter, but it matters to me mm-hmm. and you need to come back because I think I know what you can do in your life and you need to do that. Um, so again, keep in mind in the context of environments in which the messages are so negative for these students, they hear things all the time that undermine their sense of um, ability. So they hear that, oh, you know, all these people are coming into the university, they don't deserve to be here. Uh, they hear, oh, this, um, you know, this, this group of people are, you know, these are pathologically, uh, uh, you know, unsound. Um, uh, or um, this, you know, I hate these people's music because it's so gross. Uh, I hate these people's uh, cuisine because it's, you know, it's, it's, it's terrible. Um, there are so many of those things that people hear about. And so I liken it to walking across campus on a daily basis and just getting wounded constantly Mm -hmm. when people don't even know that they're wounding you. Uh, And what is a normal human being supposed to do with that? Okay, that's the question you have to think about. What is a normal human being supposed to do with the fact that they feel that way when I gave the Phi Beta Kappa lecture at Harvard, I tried to explain why my own experience at, at Harvard and, and the recognition that came to me when I was a student there, the only African-American student in my program. Um, and I remember uh, particular difficulties that I had with, with faculty and I, uh, there was a point at which I recognized, okay, this is the way it's going to be. Every single day, in every way, I will have to prove that I deserve to be here. So that's what it is. It's having to prove every day in every way that you are deserving. And that goes on for the rest of your life. So you graduate and that's not good enough. You go into a position And then you find you have to prove yourself there. And that's not good enough. 
And so that's so that's that's what that's what a lot of people experience uh, in um, in this environment is that constant um, need to prove themselves. Um, and um, one of the things that is so valuable about HBCUs is that that's erased. That's utterly erased, okay? Um, and so even if people tell you that's idiotic or this is horrible, you know, what, you, what you've written here is just no good at all, you, it still doesn't take away from you your humanity when people tell you that because you understand where that's coming from. It's coming from a place um, of embrace. Mm -hmm. So that's the metaphor that I like to use for it. Mm -hmm. And so what I hear you saying uh, is that the work is for faculty and staff to do in understanding how they are conceiving of and embracing, <laughs> to use your metaphor, our students as value, as valuable, as assets, as people who belong in the institution, that they don't have to prove that, that they should get that benefit just by matriculating in the university. Just by as soon as you admit them, you have a contract with them. Hmm. As soon as they're there. Okay. Now hmm. I used to I used to fiddle a little bit with this um, because I felt so strongly as soon as students enter, uh, this this is your compact with them. So here's what I used to say to prospective students. So hmm. we had something called a um, hosting, uh, spring hosting. And all of the students who had gotten into Brown would come uh, and they would be um, going across the campus, going to programs and trying to figure out whether or not they would choose Brown. And for the most part, they'd applied to a lot of different institutions and they were doing this everywhere and trying to decide. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and I would always speak to them. And here's what I would say to them. I'd say, you know, I'm delighted that you have been admitted um, and, um, and you know, uh, hopefully you will decide to come. But uh, let me say this, um, if you want a true educational experience um, and you want to learn from difference, um, if you want to be open-minded um, and um, embrace other cultures, um, if you want to, um, uh, to um, learn about ways of interacting with many, many different um, people, then come to Brown. But if you don't, please don't come here. Go to Harvard at some place. Uh, now, they'd always laugh about that, uh, thinking I was joking, but I actually wasn't joking. Uh, so I set the tone um, for, uh, in a sense, um, that embrace by telling students that's what I expected of them when they came. And I tried to do that by standing uh, on the green and hugging people and, and modeling that, right? And so if I'm saying to them, you must be open, you must embrace others, right? Uh, I have to be the first to do it. And so on a campus, faculty certainly represent that. Uh, administrators certainly represent that. If we're not doing it, how should we expect students to do it with regard to other students? Um, mm -hmm. Modeling that behavior is very, is very important. Thank you, Dr. Simmons. So I have lots of questions on my own, but we, you've piqued interest uh, in the chat. And so we'll check out some of those, some of those comments and questions. Um, the, the gist of, of a couple of them is this, as we, as we think about the current divisive and uh, tribalized state of our nation, uh, what, what's your sense of how we entertain or address these issues on our campuses, uh, especially dealing with the issue of free speech? And um, I, I think that this question is really great for someone like you because you mentioned in your introduction the importance of telling the truth. And, and indeed, uh, one of the things that I hear that folks uh, have a name for you, not only at Prairie View, but at other institutions, is Ruth the Truth. Uh, <laughs> and, 
<laughs> Ruth, the truth. So when we think about free speech on our campuses and all of the complexities of free speech, both for those who want to, to claim their constitutional right to free speech and those who are impacted by free speech. What's the role, what, what do you think about the, that, that, that sort of debate? And then what's the role of the university in helping the student to feel embraced, all students to feel embraced uh, from the most privileged to the least privileged in that kind of context? Well, this whole, this whole um, you know, free speech dichotomy that apparently uh, people love to, to set up is, is one that's very disturbing to me because um, one of the great things that we're able to do in a university uh, is we are able, we all have our voices. Some of those voices are going to be ugly But that does not take away our capacity to respond to it. And so uh, what we often forget when we talk about uh, horrendous uh, behavior of people who, who do and say ugly, who say ugly things, is that we have the capacity to respond to that. And that's what we should do. We shouldn't take away their ability to say stupid things. We should enable our ability to counter it by reasoned uh, speech. That, that, that's, the, that's the critical point. So when my students would say uh, to me, um, someone, you know, this group said so-and-so, you know, I'd say, well, so what? What did you say? <laughs> what did you say, right? We had an uh, incident at, um, at Brown when I first arrived where uh, this person published a very nasty uh, ad in the in the campus newspaper uh, saying that blacks were lucky to have been enslaved uh, because we were much better off uh, in this country than we ever would have been in Africa. It was very, very ugly. Um, and of course, it just completely um, set the campus off. And one of the things that a group did on campus was to invite him to campus. And naturally, that was a, you know, a fertile moment for, uh, for um, disagreement about all kinds of different things and for demonstrations. My approach was to say, okay, there, I dare anybody on this campus to be more insulted than I am by what he said. but I'm going to go and listen to him because I am confident that I can answer whatever he says. And your purpose in being here at this university is to learn how to do that, okay? Um, so we don't, we don't say enough to our students that you, um, if you are looking for eternal comfort, always in the presence of people who laud you and who do everything correctly, forget it. You're not gonna ever see that, that world. But what you can do is find a way to deal with that, um, that will be helpful to you, to help you grow and quite possibly to educate somebody who is doing it out of ignorance rather than out of hate. And so um, I used to say, we, you know, we have all kinds of requirements um, for you know, licenses and you have to do all of this. I remember when I moved to New Jersey, oh my goodness, I had to take a driver's test and I kept failing it really, but because it, was, it was, seemed to me very hard to take, but, um, but there are no requirements for you to know how to deal with people. You never, get a, you never get a course on that. You never get taught in an educational institution what the rules of engagement are for civil discourse. You, maybe some people do, but I've never heard of it anywhere. 
Uh, and yet, it's probably one of the most important things that we need to do as a nation is to figure out how we can convene, converse, reach a court, uh, and so on, in spite of immense differences. And when people ask me, well, how is it you can talk to people uh, who, who, are, who hold such heinous views? I explain to them that in segregation, in the South, we lived with people who hated us. We knew they hated us. We knew they had abhorrent views about our worth, but we still had to deal with them. And so to me, it, it seems more or less natural that is one of the skills that we have to acquire as human beings, no matter who we are, no matter where we are. It's just one of those skills that in the universities, we should be helping our students manage through. And so that's, so um, how do we help them? We help them by teaching them to acquire those skills um, and, uh, and uh, defending unflinchingly who they are uh, in spite of whatever uh, somebody says. I'll tell you too, that the thing that is most hurtful to most people who are denigrated, uh, ostracized, um, and so forth, is really not what people, hateful people say. It's the silence of other people in the face of that. And so one of the things that is very useful to do when somebody uh, is especially makes egregious claims and insults is for communities to gather around people and say, that's ridiculous, that person's a fool. I don't believe that for a minute. But so often, oddly enough, in the face of bullies, people are silenced. Just as in this past period of time, We've seen all these people who have gone absolutely silent in the face of the most egregious insults uh, coming from policymakers. It's it's very puzzling. Yes, and I would say that current discussions on our campus include as well the mechanisms that we can put in place to support students and to provide uh, not ways of closing down uh, dissent or controversial views, but to understand that students who already feel that they are not embraced need not face recklessness with respect to these kinds of issues as well. Yes. In fact, and in fact, some universities or, or, or campuses are also leaning into the law and respectful yes. policies to make sure that those who are already on the margin are not further marginalized mm -hmm. by the kinds of issues with respect to, to free speech. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think this is this is one that people are so often um, so often tie themselves into knots about. Okay, the free the so-called free speech issue, and one of the reasons they do is because it's used as a wedge issue by certain groups um, uh, because it is both a litmus test for um, certain environments. Um, and it's also um, an, an easy accusation to throw at universities. Um, and so it's used, um, it's used that way. And, and people have become very nervous about what they do about free speech because um, of the way that it, 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 the accusation um, has been honed by certain groups. Um, but I, in my view, one need not be fearful about that as long as the policies are clear. And I really do believe that it's important for uh, people to be exposed to a variety of viewpoints, uh, including viewpoints that are um, anti antithetical to their own. I, I think that's very useful and I think it's very important for universities. Uh, uh, but I also believe that um, antithetical views do not need to descend into hate speech. Um, and I think that um, it is possible for uh, institutions to take a very firm stand on hate speech. Uh, and here's the way that I always uh, did it. Um, I'd always say to my campus, 
Say anything you want. But as soon as you step over the line and you begin to encourage um, uh, an environment in which these students are going to feel unsafe, that's when I have to try to stop you. Okay, so so a lot of that um, uh, a lot of that kind of speech descends into harassment. Uh, it, it descends into intimidation. It descends into all kinds of things you can get your arms around, and you can you can actually um, you can actually address that very firmly. Uh, so so I think uh, this is a this is a sphere in which you have to be extremely knowledgeable about where the line of demarcation is. Uh, for what is allowable for uh, institutions to do, but it, uh, whatever is allowable, I, I think you have to walk right up to and over that line. If anybody's safety uh, and well-being are threatened, uh, you have to take that on. It's your responsibility as an institution. Thank you, Dr. Simmons. We have lots more questions and limited time, so I'm going to try to combine some of them to make sure that after this call is over, I can still walk safely on campus. Okay. <laughs> so, so briefly, a, a, a few decades ago, Angela Davis came up with uh, this notion for Americans to be anti-racist. And then more recently, Ibrahim Kendi's book uh, uh, is calling for us to be anti-racist. What, what are your thoughts about what anti-racism is and looks like uh, on a college campus? Um, I, I'm not necessarily myself an advocate of that um, uh, terminology, uh, I have to say. Tell um, us more. Race is a factor. Uh, it's part of our identity. Um, and um, and I, I don't like the idea that um, I cannot, for example, affirm uh, who I am. So I, I don't, I don't want to be, um, you know, it goes back to this whole uh, view uh, of will we ever get to the point where we're post-racial? I don't think so, okay. Um, uh, will we ever get to the point where we don't see race? Um, never. Um, could we get to the point where uh, we understand um, the humanity of every group of people, uh, and we accept that um, uh, excelling is not particular to any one supreme group. Could we get there? Uh, maybe. Uh, so I, I think, uh, in my view, you know what what I certainly hope we can do in universities um, is. Um, get to the point where we can talk candidly about race, about uh, racial history, um, about um, social constructs that get in the way of our seeing who people actually are. All of that uh, ought to be a part of the way we lay out um, what we're able to offer our students. Uh, but I, I you know, I, 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 the theorists um, uh, can posit um, lots of different ways of thinking about this, but I think those get us into trouble because we inevitably fake it when we try to do that. Um, my mother was the wisest of all of this, in my view, and I'm still working on that. And that is, could one come to believe in the basic humanity of everybody? Could one come to believe that um, no one is better per se than another person? Mm -hmm. Could one come to believe that everybody is owes respect even when they don't deserve it? Mm -hmm. um, those are such fundamental principles that that's, uh, that those are the kinds of things that I prefer to promote um, because when you get too complicated, uh, people don't really understand what you're saying. Okay, I mean, what, what did you say? Or do you mean, um, no, I just mean that I don't want you to disrespect that 
person. I want, it's, it's a very basic, a very simple concept that anybody can grasp. And partly in this debate that we're having around diversity today, uh, part of the problem is we can't get our arms around terminology that people can agree to. Um, I've just finished writing some principles of, of diversity and, um, and, and inclusion that I'm trying to get companies in Houston to sign off on, okay? Um, and that's a, that's a thousand entities in, in the city of Houston. Um, and can I, can I get to the language that is firm enough about how important all of this is, uh, and yet um, clear enough uh, that everybody can sign off on it. That's, and I find it enormously difficult to get to that clarity. Mm -hmm. Yes, clarity, clarity is the key. And, and in terms of clarity, one really clear question is coming from the Black Student Union. And we have a new uh, Lily, uh, Reynolds Center on campus and student, one student is asking this question, what specifically can universities do to support black students in particular, especially during the time of the Black Lives Matter movement and the continuing pandemic? Well, certainly everybody knows that the, the African-American community has been uh, disparately affected during this uh, period. Um, by the, what I call the trifecta, um, COVID, um, then the economic crisis, and of course the police brutality issue. So you can't find a group on a campus today who is not more vulnerable because of the intersection of all these things at the same time. Anybody should be able to get that. So, uh, going to African-American students in this moment and saying, this is going to be a difficult time because of all of these things. Tell us what it is you need from us. Why is that so complicated? Tell us what you need. What can we do to be helpful to, to, uh, to you? You know, there are a number of things that uh, I've tried to think about for my students. Um, and that's the reason I wrote I wrote the letter that I did uh, recently to the campus is because I wanna to say to my students, this is gonna be a tough time for you. Here's what I think I can do to help. Um, and uh, and you know, my students write directly to me and they say, well, I need this or I need that. And I try to help because I know how hard this moment is for them. Any campus should be thinking the same way about African-American students, what they can do. You know, we get, we get tied up in, into all kinds of um, knots over the question of fairness across the board, right? Oh, well, if I do this for this group, I have to do that for this group. And sometimes we are mobilized because we think that we cannot do more without being criticized. So what's, what's wrong with criticism? You know, it, it, uh, I, I, don't, I don't so much get that. Uh, so, so I would, I would um, uh, we've done more in the area of mental health uh, in this season for our uh, students, first because they ask for it, um, and second because of the uh, post-traumatic stress that we think they're gonna be suffering from uh, as a consequence of everything coming at them uh, right now. And, um, and so we've done emergency funds to help with some of the emergencies that they're experiencing because of these crises. Um, so we are, we are trying to build supports of various kinds for our African-American students um, just to be responsive because that embrace that I'm talking about, um, that embrace changes depending on the circumstances. And so, when you see how people respond uh, on Black Lives uh, Matter, um, you know, it's a dangerous time for our students who are out there fighting for the rights that we thought we had earned decades ago. It's a dangerous time for them. Uh, and what are we doing to protect them in a dangerous time? That's another, that's another uh, issue. And one of the ways we can protect them 
uh, is by helping to carry a message of involvement and the importance of social movements and the importance of activism among students. Um, instead to counter what some public officials are doing, which is putting a target on their backs mm. by, um, by excoriating them for fighting for their rights. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, again, a counterpoint to what they're experiencing in society is for us, again, to put our arms around them and to say, uh, how can we help you with your, you know, with your messaging? How can we help you with your involvement in activism um, and so forth? Uh, it's an important thing for us to do. Thank you. And, and moving now to, to Black faculty, which a group that's also important in terms of uh, retention for Black students. Um, I understand that you're working at Prairie View uh, on our new research center. Um, with related to African American experiences. Can you tell us a little bit about that as our university turns uh, to the possibility of doing something similar on this campus? What are you learning uh, as important in doing that, uh, organizing and facilitating of, of, of such a center? Uh, and could you then, tell me a little bit, yes, could you tell me what, what, your, what you're thinking about doing? Is it, is it a curricular initiative or is it a policy? Initiative. So the provost uh, initially rolled it out um, and is still working on the outlines of it. But Mike, would you like to pipe it, pop in and, and help us to understand the contours of that? Sure. Um, it is, it's interesting how we do pop in and out of these things. So the idea is to create a cross-disciplinary center of faculty working in various departments on issues of racial disparities in the United States. So for example, you might have education, you might have healthcare, you might have faculty, and it, it, it's to build an academic community for faculty who, instead of just having everybody off in their own departments, uh, not communicating with each other and not forming a scholarly community. So it's, I would say it's primarily about research, um, and but at the same time, by bringing faculty, new faculty to the university, because it's part of a hiring initiative, uh, we it will affect teaching in the university too, because the folks will be teaching these yeah. topics. Uh, well, that's that's a kind of time honored way uh, of doing it. I, I can't say uh, uh, too much because that's that's certainly. Um, fits the model of what we, what I tried to do it at Princeton, and it, it was um, it was a very successful model. And I think most universities are finding that the isolation that that often um, minority faculty experience, and often you know in the earlier days women experienced too, uh, was um, that intellectual uh, isolation. Um, because a number of different things are happening there. It's not simply uh, that they um, don't have colleagues to talk to in their particular areas. It's also often the way that they are perceived by their colleagues, um, uh, which uh, can be um, uh, challenging for them to, um, to, to try to, to handle. Um, so, so I think it's a very useful construct to bring people together in a way that will both support their scholarship, but also give them, um, give them colleagues who can share um, uh, their uh, travails uh, and help them understand how to navigate um, university uh, life. It's, a, it's lonely being the, you know, the only person in an area. Uh, it, it, it uh, and sometimes we're not very good at figuring out how to, how to, um, how to work with that, uh, I have to say, uh, I mean, what, what do you do? Uh, um, and I've, I've heard many versions of this across my career, uh, the things that people have said about individuals who are the only, uh, scholar in a particular area, uh, and, and so forth, um. 
Uh, I've heard uh, about it when it comes to recruitment and they're not able to get people uh, hired that they would like to have hired, but uh, they think other, everybody else gets a chance at getting the graduate student they want or uh, hiring the people that they would like and so forth. So, so some kind of collective is very, very good uh, to do. And it also turns out that typically uh, it renders a more robust conversation around certain kinds of issues on the campus. Uh, you also get the visibility. Um, and I think until we did this um, at Princeton, Princeton really couldn't recruit anyone, hardly. Uh, uh, but you know, once we got a critical mass of people um, in that conversation, it became very easy to, re to recruit. Uh, and, uh, and not just because they were there, but because there were really things to do and, um, and and uh, conversations to be had and work to be shared. Um, so at, at um, our, our purpose in doing it actually at Prairie View is, is somewhat different um, because we don't, it's, our faculty are not so isolated. Uh, our purpose in doing it is to really um, have the ability to influence um, uh, the uh, debate around certain kinds of issues. And we find that, uh, that faculty individually um, uh, may have less ability to do that. So for example, uh, once I put together the idea for this center, um, the legislature came to us and said, um, would you be willing to do a policy document for us for this legislative season? Um, I don't think they would have dare do that if they were working with an individual department or an individual faculty member. The idea that we were already arranged um, uh, across departments to uh, bring people together um, on, on policies uh, enabled them to say that very easily. So, so uh, the visibility is greater um, uh, if, you, if you do it that way. Thank you, Dr. Simmons. We are running up to the end of our time together and I am uh, torn about where, how to end. But I, I wanna make sure that I acknowledge a couple of things that were in the chat. First of all, you have uh, faculty here who have connections with you uh, from Brown. So one of our professors, Ma Lin Ching, uh, who is in the Honors College, uh, as well as a colleague or a student from Smith sends their highest regards. Thank you, um, thank you. Yes, uh, so, so you drew uh, folks from all over the place coming to, <laughs> to hear and, and talk with you. I, I wanted to see if we could, we could close on uh, two or three things just quickly to touch on. The first is this, the, what you did at Brown with respect to this uh, steering committee on slavery and justice. And uh, the president a couple of years ago appointed a committee on recognizing our diverse histories. We have the report from Brown, uh, immense report. Uh, what were the one or two lessons that you learned along the way from a high level policy kind of, of way uh, that, that, that might be helpful as we embark on this with a new generation of scholars aimed at, at sort of understanding the opportunities and challenges and then decoding. So that's, that's the first one. The second is uh, any uh, um, insights and wisdom for our campus at the policy level in terms of addressing the kinds of issues that black faculty face. So we understand the notion of isolation uh, and separation, but what, is that tr what does that look like in terms of ameliorating policy to make sure that faculty like students feel the embrace necessary to be successful. Uh, well, yes, ma'am. So I'll please. Take the last one first. I, um, I intimated uh, something close to this in my, in my remarks, but I'll tell you, having been a Dean of Faculty um, and worked uh, extensively with the tenure and promotion process across institutions. I do have to say that, you know, I see, I see its flaws and I see how, um, how African-American faculty and others are um, at a great disadvantage when it comes to the tenure and promotion process. 
Um, often they do, they are not aware of that because they're not inside the mechanism itself. Uh, but uh, but it is it is a process that needs some reworking. Now, when women came along, uh, and the the the, uh, the institutions decided that it wasn't quite fair uh, for women to have to come up for tenure on the same clock uh, as the traditional clock, they changed the rules uh, and extended the tenure clock uh, to give women the option. The women uh, child uh, uh, bearing years, the option of having more years um, to, um, to come up for tenure. Um, I think the inherent biases in the way that we often see work that faculty do uh, still plagues the, uh, the fate of African Americans in the, in the academy. I talk to them all over the country uh, all the time. And um, in some cases, I've kind of inserted myself in particular tenure cases at different institutions. Um, and, uh, and there's some pretty famous cases of ways in which um, African-American work has not been treated uh, appropriately. Um, the one I give all the time is the difficulty getting Toni Morrison appointed at Princeton because the English department uh, wouldn't give her an appointment, although they taught her work. Uh, they didn't think she was good enough to be a faculty member in English. Uh, and of course, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, but there are lots of examples of people who've had great, great success, African-American scholars who've had great, great success, but who have not been able to uh, make it through that process. So the first thing I would say is that you have to look very hard at, at, at your systems and at the way that people are behaving department by department in terms of looking at work. The work is what matters, okay? Not whether or not somebody is a, is a fit, a good fit. Not whether or not um, they go to, um, you know, the same, um, the same events uh, or whether they have the same taste. Because all of that I've seen in tenure cases where departments have said, well, this person doesn't really fit in well. Um, and what does that have to do with anything? So, so you want to scrub all of that to make sure that, and you want to also make sure the departments know that you are watching that. Because um, I, I had a case of a faculty member where the department, who, who was quite distinguished by the way, the department had decided that he would not be tenured. And the reason was that he, he wasn't a good fit for the department. Oh, I, well, you know, he wasn't very likable and, and, and he was, you know, churlish and all of that. And, but they had decided on that basis they were gonna deny him tenure. And, and, and I intercepted that and said, uh, you know, if you want to make a decision based on somebody's qualifications, um, I'm not going to, I'm not going to interfere. But if you dare come forward with a negative decision based on the fact that you don't like somebody, um, then you're going to have to really go back to the, to the drawing board. So taking a stand on fair practices, especially ones, um, that recognize that um, that there is implicit bias in so many um, of the decisions that we make in universities. Um, I think that's that's probably the most important thing for faculty. The second um, the second thing was tell me again that first one was um, committee on representing our diverse histories. So uh, based on the work that you did at Brown, your advice for us. What did I learn? What did we learn? Yes, um, well. Uh, what we learned was any action you take like that sets high expectations and you better be prepared for that. Okay. Um, you're not free to say lovely words about, you know, what might be done because you'll be held to account for it. Uh, and so you want to, um, to uh, bore into the things that you can do, not just the observations about it, but what are the things that you can actually do? Because we are, we've become very skeptical uh, in this arena. And what we long for more than anything else is, um, is action. Um, and we long for people 
to uh, be transparent in what they're doing. So we learned that transparency was very important. Here's what we're doing. This is the reason we're doing it and so forth, okay? Uh, secondly, um, uh, it's very important when you do these histories not to go down the road of blame, okay? Uh, when we did our study at Brown, the Brown family was still involved in Brown, all right? So we're doing a study on the evil <laughs> um, ancestors who traded in slaves and they're still involved with Brown. Hmm. And so walking that tightrope was a very good thing for us to do because we had to say, we are not interested in alienating the Brown family from Brown. Mm -hmm. And that gave us a way really of um, staying away from those areas where people tend to slide into, which is this horrible thing happened and that horrible thing happened and, you know, and so forth. Who needs that? Um, the question for us today is what are we going to do now? Um, we should tell the truth about our past, for sure. Uh, we should stop lying in all regards. Uh, we should be transparent because when, when the public stop, starts to distrust universities, what are, we, what are we left with, okay? Mm -hmm. So we're in an um, ambiguous um, situation already with regard to that public trust. Um, what we owe to our public is to be open, to be transparent, to not, to not, um, to be unflinching um, in arguing for what we believe is right, but still we've got to be very sure that uh, we are uh, we are saying what we mean and meaning what we say. Mm. Again, going back to this thread of truth that runs through uh, our discussion today, and so. We will end on one question. You inspire so many people uh, to do things that they did not think they could do before. What brings you inspiration? Um, on a daily basis, I encounter people who are willing to give their all for principles, uh, give their all to help people, give, the, give their all um, to, um, to help society. And, and that's what inspires me. The people that I see who are striving, and it doesn't matter at what level actually, matters not at all. My mother, as I said, was a maid. And one of the things that I used to watch, I used to watch her do ironing. And, um, and the way that she would iron just very meticulously. Uh, and at the time I thought, what drudgery? How, how, can, how can my mother tolerate uh, doing that for so little reward? Mm -hmm. How is that possible? But of course, in that, um, in that act, uh, I eventually came to understand the ennobling uh, impact of the things that we do as human beings that elevate us, okay? And what elevates us is not that we get a fancy position. Mm -hmm. um, what elevates us is not that we make a lot of money or we drive a, a fancy car. What elevates us is when we realize that we've done something to help somebody else that otherwise would not have had that help. That's that. So that's what, that's what, that's what keeps me going really is knowing that there are people like that every day you see them. Um, my brother uh, was one of the first people uh, to, to get COVID here uh, oh. and he, he died. And oh, so he, was, he was remarkable because uh, he was in the first kind of generation of my, my family and he had, no he had no advantages at all uh, when he was growing up. But you know what he did? He went off at a very young age um, to, he left home to join the army 
um, so that he could send his paycheck back to my parents wow. to help support us. Amazing. I mean, what, what measures up to that? Not much. And so, uh, so my admiration for him was uh, immeasurable, frankly. And for people like him who think first about what they can do to help the world and last about what they can do to help themselves. Mm -hmm. It seems on that note that you're also talking about yourself. So thank you, thank you, thank you for what you've given to us today, for what you've given you. to higher education and for what you've given to the world. Thank you. Good to be with you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.